Thanks for joining us today. If you're new, please take a moment to fill out the connection card in your bulletin and bring it to the Welcome Center in the lobby after the service is over. We have a free gift to share to let you know that we're glad you're here today. Before we get started, let's take a look at some fun things coming up at FCC. Get ready for Life Groups. We will begin a new Bible study in September that began with a simple request, follow me. Through this study, you will learn that Jesus' invitation to his first century audience was an invitation for relationships. Don't miss out on this opportunity to make new friends, start a transformational journey through the Gospels, and learn about Jesus' teaching on what it means to follow. For more information on life groups and how to join, fill out the form on the church app or pick up a form on the connection wall. This coming Thursday, September 6th, will be our first ever Thursday night worship service. It will begin at 6 p.m. and will be identical to Sunday's hour-long contemporary services. We pray that this service will provide an opportunity for worship and community to people who can't make it to church on Sundays. Be sure to share this exciting news with your friends, family, and coworkers. But please note that child care will only be provided from birth to three years old. There are lots of exciting things happening around FCC. Be sure to like us on Facebook and download the app to stay up to date with everything that is going on. Thanks for being here with us. Now let's join together in worship.
Amen. God is so good to us. Amen. We're going to sing forever rain. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me. You are love. You are love. On display for all to see. You are light. You are light when that darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true.
agradecer. Good morning, church. Good morning. How many of you maybe use the YouVersion Bible app? Anybody use that for devotions? Yeah. I really like this um, devotion that I'm doing right now, and it is connecting my family together, and I really like that too. It's called The Greatest, and the warehouse is using it um, as part of their curriculum on Sunday mornings. The devotions every day go along with that. And um, so I want to share with you a little bit from it um, that my family and I have been working on together. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What life decision are you least proud of? It's not fun to think about, but it can help us understand God's love for us, when we were at our worst, in that very moment, Jesus still decided to give everything for us. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this very verse, says that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean up. He didn't say, get a, just a little bit better, and then we'll talk about things. <laughs> While we were still sinners, that's us. He died for us. God chose to give his very best, forgiveness and eternal life through his son when we were at our worst. Why? <laughs> Why? Because he wanted to show his love for us. That it doesn't depend on us. It's given through the sacrifice of his son. And this morning, as you prepare your heart for communion, I want you to think about that. The depth and the uh, expanse of that love that is freely given to you this morning and every single day, that you can choose to have that in your life if you accept Jesus. He died on the cross for us. And this morning, when you take communion, remember that sacrifice that he made. I'm going to pray, and then you can pre prepare yourself as the servers come. The, the bread is the body of Christ that is broken for us, and the juice is his blood that was shed for each one of us. And you may take that when you are ready. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this church family, for this home to come to each week, to gather together, to connect with each other, to lay all of our sins, our faults, our failures at your feet. And Lord, we remember the sacrifice that you made on the cross for each one of us. We come before you this morning as sinners. And thank you for the sacrifice that you made. In your name I pray, amen.
Last week, you were introduced to David and Donna Baker. And our change for a dollar for last Sunday and this Sunday will be given to them. Um, Donna's sister, Andrea Roberts, attends church here. And Donna and her husband, David, recently moved back to the Jacksonville area. David um, has been diagnosed with cancer and has been very ill. Donna has been working uh, lots of hours trying to keep things afloat for them as she cares for her husband as well. And this morning, we have the opportunity to add to last Sunday's change for a dollar by just giving one extra dollar above your regular offering in the containers at the doors. This family can know the love of Christ. Their immediate need right now is financial, as you can imagine. And we as a church body can love them this morning. So as you prepare to give your tithes and offerings today, I ask that you would pray for this family. That their struggle would be a little bit more peaceful because of what we can give. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you again for this church body, for our family that can come together to lean on each other and to help others in our community. God, we ask a special blessing upon the offering today that it would not only be a blessing to this church family and all the things that we do here, but that change for a dollar would be change for the bakers. Lord, that they would know you they would know your amazing love because of this gift. In your name I pray, amen. How do you respond when God says no? When your prayers aren't answered or your dreams don't come together quite the way that you planned? Can you take no for an answer or do you get mad at God and give him the silent treatment? Do you make life miserable for yourself and everybody else that's around you? You know, if we're all really honest, there are times when God says no and it makes no sense at all. Like whenever a child gets sick or injured and we, we all join together and we pray for healing. But then after a few weeks or maybe a few months, the child dies and we don't understand. Or whenever we apply for that dream job, and it all makes complete sense. It's got to be a God thing because we're going to be so much closer to family. You know, our, our kids are going to be able to go to a better school. The, the pay is going to be so much better. But then we get a phone call saying, I'm sorry, but we've selected somebody else for the position. Or maybe it's when you and your spouse, you try and try to have a baby. You pray to God that he will bless you with a child. You do everything that the doctors tell you. you. You take all the fertilization medicines. But then the pregnancy tests, they keep coming back each month negative. Well, how you respond 
to denial says a lot about your spiritual maturity. The NBA has this thing called the G League, which is pretty much the exact same thing as the minor leagues of basketball. And each year in in July, NBA teams hold open tryouts for any individual that would like to, to have a chance to make a G League roster. You have to pay $650, and if you make one of the teams, you'll get paid $12,000 a year. Well, I heard about some of these individuals that have tried out for the G League in the past. There was one guy, he was 41 years old. There was another guy that paid $1,700 for round-trip airfare from Budapest. He was six foot tall, and he weighed 135 pounds. Now, call me negative, but it seems like to me if you're 41 years old or you weigh 135 pounds, God maybe has already said no to that dream, and you need to realize that it's unrealistic and move on. But the Bible says things like, ask and it'll be given to you. The Bible says, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And there are some health and wealth preachers out there that that focus on those verses, but they don't point out the counter verses that say, ask according to God's will, or God is a father who gives good gifts to his children. And they leave this impression on immature believers that all you have to do is really just name it and claim it. If you believe it enough, then it'll happen. But I want us to see today that God does not always give us the desires of our heart. God doesn't always answer your prayers with a yes. There's somebody that said that God answers our prayers one of four ways. Yes, no, wait, And you got to be kidding me. You know, what if you don't get the job? What if the house doesn't sell? What if you don't get married? What if you don't have enough money whenever it comes time to retire? Well, how you react to God's no, it says a lot about your character, and it probably determines a lot about your happiness in life. Today, I want us to look at Numbers chapter 20. We're going to look at a time when God said no to Moses. In Numbers chapter 20, you've got the Israelites, and they're setting up camp in the desert of Zin, but there was a problem. There was no fresh water there. Well, these people, they became so thirsty, they started to yell at Moses. They started to say things to him like, why did you bring us to this place? You're a horrible leader. We we should have never left Egypt. Now, let's pick up the story in Numbers chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 7 through 12. It says, and the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it'll pour out its water. You'll provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand, and he struck the rock twice with the staff, And water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I am giving them. Now that sounds like a pretty severe punishment for such a minor offense. See, what's happening here is God is telling Moses that he can't enter into the promised land because instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. Now, we got to remember, Moses, he found himself in a very similar situation years earlier, and that time, God instructed him to strike the rock. So he's just doing what he had, what he had done years earlier. So why is it this time that the, that the punishment is so severe? You know, this is a guy that has spent the last 40 years of his life leading these negative and complaining people into the promised land. And for God to say no, that you can't go in, that that, that seems harsh to us. You know, where's God's grace in this situation? Well, Moses, he felt that way too. I want us to, let's fast forward. We're going to fast forward one book in the Bible. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 3. And this is where Moses, he's pleading to God to change his mind. Let's look at verse 25 and 26. It says, Please let me cross the Jordan to see the wonderful land on the other side, the beautiful hill country and the Lebanon mountains. But the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he would not listen to me. That's enough, he declared. Speak of it no more. God's no to Moses was final. He he was not going to get to enter into the promised land, and to us, that seems harsh. But today, I want to give you five reasons why I believe that this judgment was fair. The first thing that I want us to see today is that it was a repeat offense. 
It was a repeat offense. This was not the first time that Moses had lost his temper. Moses, he had a character flaw of anger, and it was something that he seemed that he could never get under control. Whenever he was younger, there was a time that he saw an Israelite that was being beaten by an Egyptian taskmaster, and he lost it, and Moses killed the Egyptian. There was another time that Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and on his way down, he saw that the people were worshiping a gold idol that his brother Aaron had set up, and he lost it. He took the two stone tablets, and he threw them to the ground, and he broke them into pieces. There was another time when Moses said, to, he cried out to God, he said, God, just wipe these people off the map. And now, instead of speaking to the rock, he gets mad, and he hits the rock with the staff. You know, I think every one of us in this room, we have character flaws, and Moses' character flaw was his anger, and he was never able to get that under control. Well, another factor that I want us to see today is that this was a bad example to the people. This was a bad example to the people. The scripture tells us that Moses, he did this in front of all the Israelites. There are high expectations that come from being a leader, and if this disobedience by Moses were to go unpunished, then the people would have had the impression that their, their disobedience, it really didn't matter. That if God had told them that they needed to do something, that it was optional. One other reason that I think this offense was so bad is because Moses, he took credit for the miracle. Moses took credit for the miracle. He said to the people, he said, must we bring you water from this rock? Now it is a serious offense whenever you start taking credit for what God has done or what, what God is doing. The Bible has lots of examples of people that did that, and it never ended out well for these people. King Nebuchadnezzar, he's a great example. One day he was on the roof of his palace, and he was walking on it, and he was overlooking Babylon. And he said to himself, wow, look at this kingdom that I've created. And the Bible says that right at that second, God stripped him of his, posi of his position. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar, he turned into a crazy man that started eating grass like the cows. Another example is King Saul. Saul, he, he started off, he was a man that followed God, but after Saul had been king for a little, bit of, a little bit of time, he started to forget about the one that was behind all of his blessings. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit departed from Saul, and eventually Saul would go on to lose his kingdom and be killed by his enemies. Well, a fourth factor that I want us to see today is that whenever Moses struck the rock, he caused damage to a sacred symbol. He caused damage to a sacred symbol. You see, this was not just your everyday, ordinary rock. The New Testament tells us that this rock, it represented Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that supplies us with living water that satisfies us, and Jesus was to only be struck once. The Bible says that he was crucified once and for all. And after that, all we have to do is call on his name to be saved. But because of Moses' anger, that sacred symbol was destroyed. Well, fifthly, and probably most importantly, I want us to see that Moses was eventually allowed to enter into the promised land. Moses was eventually allowed to enter into the promised land. Hundreds of years later, in Matthew chapter 17, we read about a supernatural event when Jesus climbed a mountain with Peter, James, and John. It tells us that it was on this mountain that Jesus was transformed. Let's look at Matthew 17 too. It says, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And then Matthew chapter 17, it goes on to tell us that there on the mountain with, Mo or there on the mountain with Jesus was Moses and Elijah. So in this moment, Moses was there in Israel. God not only took Moses into heaven, he later allowed him to come back into the promised land showing us that God's judgment is fair and God's grace is always greater than our sins. Well, before we close this morning, I want to give you three reasons as to why God may say no to our request. God may say no to you as punishment for your sin. Now, sometimes, not often, but sometimes, God may say no to you as a punishment for your sin. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it says, My child... Don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. Now, we've all heard parents say, you know, I, I love you too much to let you to continue to act that way. And then there's discipline. 
And God, who is a loving father, whenever we rebel, he's going to find a way to discipline us or, or to try to nudge us back onto the right track. There are several examples in the Bible of God directly punishing somebody because of their sin. In the Old Testament, Lot's wife, she was turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back. Miriam, she questioned Moses' leadership, and she was temporarily struck with leprosy. In the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, they were struck dead because they lied. Elymas, he was struck blind because he tried to, to challenge the Apostle Paul's teaching. But that's not the norm. I think most of the time, God just allows for the natural consequences of our sin to develop. The Bible tells us that your sin will find you out. Now, maybe you've got anger issues, and if you don't get it under control, then one day you're going to mouth off to the wrong person at work, and you're going to lose your job. Or if you cheat in school years later, you might screw up on a project because you weren't prepared. Or if you lie on your taxes, you, you might get a letter from the IRS that says, hey, we're going to need an explanation about some things. A man reaps what he sows. Now, that does not mean that God won't forgive you, but it does mean that he'll allow you to live with the earthly consequences. In Hebrews chapter 12, it gives us advice about how we should react whenever God's discipline comes our way. In verse 7, it says, As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. And then if you skip down to verse 11, it says, No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. I think every parent loves that moment when our kids come up to us and they still have tears in their eyes and they say, Dad, I'm sorry. And you say, well, are you going to do it again? And they say, no. And then we respond and we let our kids know just how much we love them. And I think that's the exact same heart that our Heavenly Father wants us to have whenever we're being disciplined. You know, a good example of that in the Bible is King David. Whenever David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband Uriah murdered to try to cover it up, Nathan the prophet, he went to confront him. And King David, he felt so guilty that he pleaded with God to forgive him. Nathan says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, The Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for the sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. Now David's child was born with health problems. And for a week, David, he cried out to God in prayer. He refused to eat. He, he fasted and he prayed that, that God would spare the life of his child. And whenever David's child's child died, the, his advisors, they were afraid to tell him because they were scared that he might do something drastic. But whenever David saw him whispering, he asked and they told him that indeed his child was dead. And in that moment, the Bible says that David, he got up, he bathed, he put on fresh clothes, and he went to the temple, and he worshiped. Then he came back, and he asked for something to eat. And, they, and David's advisors, they said, David, we don't understand your reaction. And he says, well, while the child was alive, I prayed that God would be kind, and he would maybe spare the life of the child. But now that my child is dead, I cannot bring him back, but I'll go to him one day. And then the Bible goes on to say that David comforted Bathsheba. You know, it's no wonder that the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. You know, because instead of being bitter, instead of being angry about something that I don't completely understand, something that seems completely unfair to me, he accepted God's no with grace and with dignity. Well, the next thing that I want us to see is that sometimes God will say no because it's not about you. It's not about you. He's got somebody else in mind for the role. Somebody that's maybe better qualified or somebody that needs the assignment. Somebody that can cope with it better than you. And you know what else? You're not his only child. He's got over 7 billion other people in this world that are wanting their heart's desires. You see, you're not the only one that's praying. While you're praying that you might win American Idol, there is five million other people that are praying the exact same thing. While you're praying that you might get to marry that, that beautiful single girl that you work with, there might be 20 other guys that are praying the same thing. While you're praying that your son might make those, those critical free throws at the end of the game because you know it's going to do so much to boost his confidence, there might be a lady on the other side of the gym that's praying that he misses so that her husband, who's the coach, will get to keep his job and keep food on the table. 
You're not his only child. Now, I'm not one that believes that God causes everything, uh, causes everything that happens in this world, even the tragedies. But I do believe that God allows some things to happen that he has the power to prevent. And he promises that somehow in the grand scheme of things, that all things will work together for the good of those that love Christ Jesus. And I do know that eternity matters a whole lot more than time. And the Bible tells us that our present sufferings are nothing compared to the glory that he'll reveal to us one day. Sometimes God says no because you're not his only child. So God, he said no to Moses, and he said no to, to David, and I want us to see a time when he said no to a reasonable request from the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and 9, uh, it says this, To keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So three times, Paul, he prayed that God would remove this thorn in the flesh. Paul had some sort of painful physical condition. No, nobody knows exactly what it was, but Paul's request for healing, it seems reasonable. You know, God can do anything. And if there was anybody that deserved to live a pain-free life, I believe it was the Apostle Paul. But God said no. Three times Paul prayed, and three times God said no. Well, how do you know when God says no? Well, sometimes I think it's obvious. You pray that your daughter won't marry that guy, and she marries that guy. Or you pray that you get that promotion, and you don't get the promotion. You know, God said no. Sometimes I think you can just sense it in your spirit somehow. You, you pray and pray about it, and you say, you know what? I think God said no. Sometimes... God, he speaks through his people, and you have Christian friends that are wise, and they give you the exact same advice, and you know that God said no. But until you have an obvious no, the Bible tells us to keep on asking, to keep on seeking. But Paul, he got a direct message from God that he was going to have to continue to live with this thorn, and he explained God's no by saying, it's to keep me from becoming too full of pride. God said no. If Moses had the character flaw of anger, and if David had the character flaw of lust, I think it's reasonable to believe that Paul might have had the character flaw of pride. You see, Paul was a very educated man. God had done some pretty incredible things through the Apostle Paul, and if he wasn't careful, it would have been very easy for him to have a prideful spirit. So God allowed this physical condition. But Paul, he received God's no with grace. Well, the last thing that I want us to see today is that sometimes God, he says no to the desires of our heart because he knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. God has a knack for taking what seems like the lowest moments in our life and, and bringing about something so much better than we could ever imagine. He knows you better than you know yourself. And if God doesn't give you the desires of your heart, you need to accept God's ways as being better than your ways. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, it says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Do you remember when Mary and Martha, they, they sent an urgent message to Jesus? They said, Come at once, Lazarus, our brother, the one that you love so much. He's sick. But Jesus said no. And by the time that Jesus had arrived, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And Mary and Martha, they were extremely upset. They told him, they said, Jesus, if you just would have came when we asked, he wouldn't have had to have died. You, you would have been able to heal him. Jesus, why didn't you come? But Jesus wasn't four days late. He was right on time because he raised Lazarus from the dead, which, which was an even more dramatic and impressive miracle. Sometimes, God, he may ask you to wait four days. He may ask you to wait four, four months or 40 years before you understand the why. But the Bible tells us in Romans 8.18, yet what we suffer now, it's nothing compared to the glory that he'll reveal to us later. So how do you respond whenever you don't fully understand the why and you can't, can't put all the pieces together? Are you able to humbly say, God, I believe that you have the answers. When you can't see God moving in your situation, are you willing to trust his heart? Because that's the issue. If God said no to, to Moses and he said no to David and he said no to Paul, don't you think that he'd say no to, to you and me too? 
As a matter of fact, God said no to Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, he prayed, Father, if there is any other way, don't allow me to suffer this way. And that was such an intense prayer that, that for three hours, Jesus, he prayed on his face. The Bible says that he literally, he, had, he, had, uh, he was sweating blood. But God said no. And Jesus, he left the garden on, a, on, a way, on his way to his death saying, Father, not my will be done, but yours. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it says, Keep our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Let's pray. God, you are a good God. This life is hard and there are so many times in in life where we don't understand God. We don't understand the why. But Father, I pray that you allow us to trust that your ways are so much greater than our ways. Father, it's hard because you are the creator and we're the created and we don't understand everything. But God, help us to be okay with that. Help us to put our complete and total trust in you, even in the tough times. Father, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now we're going to have a time of ministry where we want to invite you to come forward for prayer. Maybe God has said no to you about something and you just can't, you can't grasp it. You don't understand the why behind it. And you just want to come this morning and you want to, to pray to God and just ask him for some clarity. Ask him for, for some help in this situation. Maybe you have a health need. Maybe somebody's struggling in your family or you have a, a health problem. You just want to come and bring that forward today. Maybe your marriage is struggling right now and you just want to come and you want to talk to God and ask for help in your marriage. Whatever your, your, your prayer need might be, we want to invite you to come as we stand and sing this next song.
Let's pray. Father, this world can be so tough at times, and I'm so thankful that you've got the, the gift of heaven waiting on us, and I, I can only imagine what it'll be like, and I'm so thankful that you loved us enough that you sent your son Jesus so that one day we can experience heaven. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us today. I want to remind you that this Thursday night we're going to be starting up a new worship opportunity for you at 6 p.m. It's a contemporary service. It'll be identical to what we do here on Sunday mornings. I would love to have some people help us jumpstart that service. So if you're available this Thursday night at 6, we hope to see you there. Have a great week.